Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the company LuLaRoe and multi-level marketing companies in general? The circumstances behind some of the difficulties with LuLaRoe were explored in a docu-series on Amazon called Lula Rich. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So first I'll look at the background in this case, then I'll offer my analysis. LuLaRoe was incorporated in 2013 by a married couple, Deanne Brady and Mark Stidham. The company is based in Corona, California. Both Deanne and Mark are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which I will refer to as LDS. Deanne was from a large family. She was number 10 of 11 children. She had a history of being an entrepreneur. She would purchase and resell clothing. Mark was also oriented toward being in business for himself. The couple had met on an airplane and would eventually marry. They would have 14 children, several of them adopted. Some of these children, as well as other relatives, worked in leadership positions in LuLaRoe. The name LuLaRoe actually came from three of the grandchildren of Deanne and Mark. The basic structure of LuLaRoe went something like this. They manufactured various items of clothing. Maxi dresses were popular early on, and then in 2014, they added leggings to the product line. It would become one of their more popular products. LuLaRoe would have retailers, which were also called fashion consultants or distributors, purchase products to get started in the business. The minimum startup cost was around $5,000. These retailers would sell directly to the public as well as attempt to recruit other distributors. This is where we get into the whole multi-level marketing component. I will refer to multi-level marketing as MLM. LuLaRoe offered an arrangement that was appealing to women who wanted to earn full-time income working part-time. Most of the retailers were white women with families. The company viewed itself as empowering women. LuLaRoe started growing rapidly, adding thousands of retailers during their first few years in operation. In 2015, the company earned $70 million in revenue. By the end of 2016, they had generated $1.3 billion and had 60,000 consultants. According to Mark, they were growing 25% month over month. As far as the value to the end user, LuLaRoe offered myriad different patterns. This was kind of their brand. A lot of variety was offered. They were continuously generating new prints. Usually, they would only release 5,000 copies of any given pattern. The more desirable patterns would be referred to by retailers and customers as unicorns. As far as the multi-level marketing piece, Recruiting was how the fashion consultants could make real money. Selling directly could generate some money, but it was challenging. Recruiting was the way to go and something LuLaRoe encouraged. Initially, the company offered an attractive bonus structure for consultants to make money by adding more consultants under them. This gets into the area of upline and downline. When a consultant recruits another, the recruiting consultant is the upline and the person they recruited is the downline. This would continue for several levels, just like a pyramid, which is one of the reasons that multi-level marketing companies get accused of being pyramid schemes. The way that LuLaRoe is structured, when a consultant recruited somebody, the consultant became a sponsor. When they had 10 people under them, they were promoted to a trainer. When they had three trainers under them, they moved to a coach. And then finally, they could reach the level of mentor by getting three coaches under them. So again, it's easy to picture a pyramid structure here. Some of the retailers were making a lot of money and bonuses, tens of thousands of dollars a month. The company was adding retailers at a rate of 500 a day. The competition among the consultants increased dramatically. Retailers were frequently fighting with one another for the same customers. There were simply too many. They had saturated many areas with consultants. Rapid growth also led to problems with the quality of the product including clothing that had holes in it and patterns that it would appear no one really checked before shipping them, like there would be weird objects on the crotch area of the clothes. In 2017, when LuLaRoe had about 80,000 consultants, they modified their bonus structure to be based on actual sales. This cut bonuses by about 
They also initiated a temporary 100% buyback policy, although it was not represented as temporary. This led to a lot of new consultants joining, but also about $100 million in refunds, as many distributors left. When LuLaRoe reversed the buyback policy, a number of lawsuits started coming in. Eventually, they would be facing about 50 lawsuits. Lawsuits alleged that the company incorrectly calculated sales tax, misled with their advertising, and engaged in unfair business practices. The state of Washington sued them for being a pyramid scheme. LuLaRoe settled this case for $4.75 million and made some changes to policies. At the time making this video, LuLaRoe continues to operate with about 18,000 distributors, when at one time they had about 80,000. Now moving to my analysis. The docu-series on Amazon Prime covered the story pretty well, and I think overall did a good job at capturing many of the feelings and dynamics at work in the LuLaRoe adventure. Much of this applies to other MLM companies as well. I will go through a few of the items that really stood out to me. Item number one is the empowering women message of LuLaRoe. I think that this is what really made the company special at first. It's why so many women wanted to sell the product. The vision was particularly effective at recruiting stay-at-home moms who liked the idea of working part-time for full-time money and doing something enjoyable. It appears as though the values of LDS became wrapped up in this, as expressed by Deanne and Mark, which some of the distributors found to be unsettling. Even still, the empowering women piece was a major part of the appeal of LuLaRoe and many other MLM companies. It was not just about money, it was about a lifestyle and a sense of accomplishment. Item number two is the incorporation of the family members at a leadership level in LuLaRoe. We also see this with again, other MLMs. This is an expensive mistake I've seen many times. It's a bad idea for a few reasons. One, relatives are often less qualified than someone who can be found by posting the position and interviewing many people. Two, it demoralizes employees, making them feel as though there's no real chance to be promoted because higher level jobs are reserved for incompetent family members. Three, it makes people question the judgment of the owners of the company. Do they really know what they're doing if they can't figure out how to avoid overvaluing relatives? Item number three is the lack of quality advice apparent in MLMs. This is one of those elements that stands out in the larger MLM culture, one of the distinctive features. There are many attempts to motivate and inspire without actually providing anything helpful. It's a lot of noise and very little signal. You hear phrases like, build your business. Think success into existence. All you need to do is believe in yourself. In order to achieve success, you have to picture it. If you're failing in your business, it's your fault. Winners make money. Losers make excuses. You must choose to follow your dreams. We're not in the clothing business. We're in the people business. This one is actually from LuLaRoe. Mark said it during the docuseries. In an effort to motivate, MLMs actually end up discouraging people. They don't actually provide concrete steps to success, rather just these catchy, meaningless phrases that don't actually make any difference. Motivational speakers, success stories, and overly positive self-help style books are brought in when there is no substance to a company, when there's no logical and rational message about how to be successful. Item number four is the special significance of top earners. The way to be successful in an MLM is simply to be in early. Those are the people who make the real money. There's usually no actual skill differential between the top earners and people who don't make as much money. The MLMs exalt the top earners as if there's something amazing about them. They are formed into idols. People hang on their every word. They become like rock stars. They claim to possess special knowledge, which somehow they always fail to communicate in any clear way. It's like they're being cryptic when they try to offer advice. Item number five is the importance of image to LuLaRoe and similar companies. This is related to item number four, bit. Without any actual skill or substance, the focus becomes image. Looking the right way, flaunting real or imagined wealth. In the docuseries, they talked about how key people associated with LuLaRoe would go down to Mexico to have weight loss surgery. They called themselves the Tijuana Skinnies. It's all about looking the part. LuLaRoe brought in celebrities 
for their key special events, like Katy Perry, Kelly Clarkson, and Mario Lopez. In the docuseries, the guy who handled the events said that he booked Mario Lopez for way under budget. He was stunned at how cheap he was. That seemed like an unnecessary, yet somehow accurate jab at Mario Lopez. Item number six is the pressure the company puts on consultants to give more. LuLaRoe encouraged people to take extraordinary means to find the money to join as a distributor. According to some of the distributors, they were told to do things like borrow money, sell cookies, and sell breast milk. LuLaRoe would tell distributors to order more products, invest more time, and put in more effort. This was supposed to be a part-time opportunity to make money, but in reality, selling products is a lot of work. Item number seven is how many of the MLMs are similar to religions and some function like cults. The evidence that supports this actually connects to several of the items I mentioned. Celebrating the significance of the top earners, they are like cult leaders. This reminds me of people like Jim Jones and David Koresh. If they were wearing leggings from LuLaRoe, they would be even scarier and tackier cult leaders. They have nothing to offer, but they pretend to be amazing, like they were just somehow chosen. They just keep promoting positivity without evidence to back up their optimism. Mark apparently read passages from the Book of Mormon during one of his talks and said that he was misunderstood like Joseph Smith, a key figure in LDS. Deanne admitted that she's not good with numbers, yet people were supposed to have faith that she could run a company. MLM companies emphasize how they are a family, a community of believers. That's what's necessary. Simply to believe things like magic money will fall from the sky, the laws of competition do not exist, and the pyramid structure can keep extending to infinity. They possess unbridled confidence. People deemed to be negative are labeled as non-believers, even if they still actually believe in the company vision. Dissenting opinions are never allowed. The emphasis on image fits in with this cult mentality. I find it interesting that the top people at Lulero traveled to Mexico for surgery. Members of the Heaven's Gate cult did the same thing. Now, of course, the Heaven's Gate cult people didn't go for weight loss like the Lulero people did. Rather, they went to get castrated, which I guess technically is a small amount of weight loss, but that wasn't the goal. Image is crucial to cults. They all have a specific look to them an aesthetic that must be maintained. It represents conformity and unity, like they're all in this together. Their belief in nonsense is okay because they're not alone. People are becoming indoctrinated into a belief system more so than actually learning a sales process. They're not learning about business. They're learning about believing the same thing as other people based on faith. The last element that makes MLMs look like a cult is how they label people who complain as playing the victim. The company is never the problem, rather the distributors are to blame. The company engages in gaslighting. In a sense, the company is widely affected by narcissism. They believe in the perfection of what they have designed. Moving to my final thoughts and lessons learned. For the vast majority of people, being involved with multi-level marketing companies of any type is a bad idea financially. A very small number of people make a decent amount of money, and everyone else does not. Other than the cult-like aspects and shallowness of so many of these MLM companies, much of the problem comes down to competition. Many traditional companies have protected territories so that a distributor does not compete with their own company. Business success is subject to the laws of supply and demand. Direct selling is a skill that definitely has value, but not so much that someone who does it should expect full-time income from part-time work. Something else to keep in mind which I think is evident somewhat in the docu-series, when someone in business for themselves does start making money, they should not run out and buy new vehicles, a new home, expensive clothes, or go out to expensive dinners. No matter how much money somebody's making, managing money responsibly is always indicated. Those are my thoughts on the company LuLaRoe. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis to be as inspiring as a multi-level marketing motivational speaker. Thanks for watching.